me share a little something from The Economist magazine in 2010. They polled Americans about what category of government spending are you willing to cut. Now, the only area in which a majority of Americans, 71%, uh, said they would cut was foreign aid. The rest of the numbers broke down like this. Social Security, 7% would cut. Uh, national Defense, 22%. Medicare, 7%. Aid to the poor, 17%, Medicaid, 11%, veterans benefits, 6%, health research, 13%, education, 12%, highways, 12%, mass transit, 27%, unemployment benefits, 19%, science and technology, 22%, agriculture, 27%, housing, 27%, and the environment, 29%. Why should we not feel that it's completely hopeless? <laughs> Well, I, I think it depends on how you ask the question. Anytime you do a poll, it's how you ask the question. For example, if you ask the question in a poll and you said, with all the baby boomers retiring, we're running short of money, it looks like Social Security will not last, would you accept, and there's a lot of young people out here, and I know you will accept it, but even to the general public, will you accept that we gradually raise the age to 70 over 30 years? Would you accept that? I think over 50% of the public would accept that, particularly given the alternative is that the whole problem, you know, goes into bankruptcy. So I think there is, a, I think people are more willing to accept it than the 7%, you know, and I think people recognize the severity of the problems much more so than they did two years ago, three years ago. Even the Democrats are waking up that there is a problem. They just don't know how to fix it. They're not bold enough to come up with solutions, but I think people know there are problems. Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, most of the members over there see it as a serious uh, problem as, as we all do. Uh, if they did, they would do something about it, and they don't. I mean, uh, and as long as our government can spend and borrow enough money and come up with printing it and the market's tolerated, they're going to do it. They're addicted to that, and the pain is too great for them to do something else. So that's why that is going to continue. But it will end, and that's why we have to do our work and be prepared, because it is going to end in a dollar crisis, because all we're doing is monetizing everything, you know, whether it's bad mortgages or treasury bills or whatever. And uh, <coughs> that, that will come to an end. Uh, so we have to keep plugging along. I think if we were serious, this is what we would do. We'd go through the 13 appropriations bill and fight it out and find out what it is. and. Uh, have an agreement at the end that, uh, you know, you don't have to balance the first year, but if you were serious, maybe you would take 10% or 12% and cut everything equally and quit the arguments and just cut it off to say, this is a crisis. You'd have to do it in your family. So why shouldn't we have to do it there? Just just have it and have the agreement that everybody gets cut. But, uh, <laughs> always tricky to time these, and you can't know when something's going to happen. And particularly the crisis that could hit us could happen very suddenly. There could be a sudden loss of confidence among uh, investors around the world, interest rates could spike up, and you don't know when or under what conditions that could happen. But having said that, now let me ask the unfair question. It's 2025. What do you think America looks like? Good night, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs> I think by 2025. Yes. How many years is that? 14. <laughs> 14 years, I, I think America's going to look quite different. I think we will have gone through the major, major crisis that I have been worried about since 1971. I mean, we're at the beginning of it, we're in the middle of it, but it's going to get a lot worse, and some event is going to come along and precipitate a major crisis, and we will be forced to retrench. I think we will have to face up to the fact that we'll have a new and different monetary system. The contest then will be between us who want to sound honest money and a sovereign money uh, versus the internationalists that are going to come along and play games with it and want to take it over. But I, I predict America uh, will be prosperous, but much uh, its, its responsibilities will be much different, much smaller. And some Americans will be so upset because it will be some other nation that will move in and have more influence. Some of those nations now that don't owe everybody else so much money. We will not be maintained as the world power, and that won't be all that bad because we'll maybe go back to concentrating on freedom and taking care of ourselves and responsibility. <laughs> headed
transfer crisis, and most of the uh, predictions say that within a decade, if you look at the budget, that entitlements and interest will consume the whole budget, which means nothing left uh, for any other programs. And so I think there will be a crisis. How we handle the crisis, you know, as my father says, we will probably print money to take care of it, and then the result is inflation. Um, I think that crisis does come before 2025. I think it comes sometime in the next decade. There are choices, though. I think the future is not predestined to be one way or the other. I think that we, we wouldn't be here if we didn't think we could alter the course of history, if we didn't think we could change that. I don't think the willpower is in our elected officials yet to do it. But the thing is, is like I say, I may be one voice, my dad may be one voice, but we have, you know, we're getting the attention of people, one, because they perceive the problem coming. As the problem gets nearer and nearer and more imminent and more people understand that the problem's coming, maybe we can wake up enough people. Maybe many of you could come to Washington and help. You know, maybe we can elect new people. So I continue to believe that we could change things before there is a crisis. I do think there will be a crisis of debt. There's not enough money to spend on all of the programs that everybody wants. There's still a disconnect. But I, I think that uh, we could change things before it's too late. And pe more and more people are waking up to this. So I still am optimistic that we can circumvent this. If not, I'd be off in the Cayman somewhere with a, you know, a pile of gold or something. You know, it's, it's, it's not too late. You know, I still, it's not time to go to Galt Sculpt yet. You know? so, uh, I think it's worth remembering how far we've come. We tend to be pessimistic in this movement sometimes for the, for the reasons that Congressman Paul just laid out, and rightfully so. But at the same time, look at how many people are in this room. Look at what happened in the main hall at CPAC today. Look who's a senator. Who would have thought that too would be here today? So combined with the Tea Party movement, which shares a lot of our values, delivered Senator Paul his victory there in Kentucky, I think we have a lot of reason for optimism. When you look across the ideological spectrum, even people who voted for Obama, nobody likes this massive government debt and spending. They are turned off by it across the political spectrum, and I'm sure there's reason to be optimistic in that sense, if you both agree with that. Yeah, I, I think so, and that's uh, that's what keeps us going. A lot of people ask me how I keep doing this year after year. <laughs> and uh, it's because... Uh, well, well, first, I tell people honestly, uh, when they ask me, why am I not frustrated? I'm not, I'm not frustrated. I always tell them, well, I've always been worked on uh, low expectations. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, things have changed uh, much more so than I ever dreamed. Uh, I thought I would come and go, and nobody would notice I had ever been to Congress. So, <laughs> Suddenly, it's you. 
Michigan. Michigan. It was yeah, Michigan. It, it, was, it was Michigan. That's where I think, you know, even when I wrote my book about it. And the Fed, I said, that's where the slogan came up. People spontaneously started to yeah, the Fed and the Fed. But I, I guess I also uh, remember very clearly when they started burning Federal Reserve. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it definitely was different because for the 30 years, because the 30 years of going about, I always went to the campus, always went to talk to young people, I have firm convictions that a revolutionary change comes with young people. And yet, for years and years, I would go and it'd be 15 or 20 or 25. But today, if I go to a campus, I get a few more. <laughs> about an issue that the two of you gentlemen are working together on, the, the audit of the Fed question. Now, we, we get a lot of the, the argument that, oh, I don't know what you're talking about. The Fed is already audited. So please don't audit us further. Like, what, what exactly is it that the Fed, and I think you this, that the Fed is not now disclosing that you want them to disclose? Well, almost everything. <laughs> <laughs> so the, uh, the partial audit that we got last year, they were supposed to reveal everything they did during the uh, period of bailout and tell us, uh, we're, who got the money and what for and what the collateral was, and we don't have that within a month or so they're supposed to reveal that. But the one thing that they really cling to and upsets them is the uh, decisions made with uh, foreign central banks, foreign governments, and uh, international financial organizations. This is where I think the big stuff goes on, because their budget now, especially during these emergencies, much bigger than the Congress. So that's why this is a big problem when they can spend, print money and spend it and never even ask us permission to go out and get involved, I think, in foreign policy. If they're propping up governments and central banks and they have quid pro quo, we'll give you money, loan money to the central bank, and you do this, and on and on. So it's mostly that, but it's everything that they do on a daily basis. You know, the discount window. Uh, for a long time, I would say that... Uh, there was less information, but I would say in the last 30 years, especially since it's a total fiat currency, they're up to more, uh, more of these shenanigans, and uh, I think that's why we built the momentum. Of course, the crisis has given us the momentum for audit of the Fed. Now, are there specific ways that your subcommittee chairmanship can give impetus to the audit of the Fed movement? Well, a lot of people think all we have to do is issue a subpoena, and they'll have to bring it to us. Uh, I wish it were that easy. The first thing is that they told me to write on it. The chairman and the chairman of the Federal Reserve and the Secretary of the Treasury are not obligated to go to a subcommittee. Uh, they will, of course, it will be my subcommittee that will be seen under the full committee that when Bernanke is required to come twice a year, so we have a little bit uh, a chance, you know, at that time. But uh, no, they will resist us. Even if we pass the law today and pass it in the Senate, and a president would sign it, which is highly unlikely, the Fed is going to resist it. It's going to drag it through the courts for years. They'll, we'll probably have our major crisis before we can find out what's in the book. But the more we put pressure on them and the more they resist, the more we can decide that they're trying to hide something. Yeah. And we should, you know,